This is a Khalid Times podcast. You are listening to the Star Tech Podcast, your weekly dose of all things technology. I'm your host, Mr. Aurelius, and I'm excited to take you on a journey through the latest trends, innovations, and fascinating stories from the world of tech. So grab your headphones, grab your coffee, and open your mind because we are ready to blow it wide open. Let's go. On the show today, Dan Tepriero, founder, CEO, CIO, and managing partner of One Roundtable Partners and 10T Holdings. The combined entities manage $1.2 billion worth of investments in 26 private companies across the DAE, which stands for Digital Assets Ecosystem. One RT is now the only active growth stage investor exclusively focused on the blockchain and also the crypto space. We are thrilled to have Dan Tepiero in the studio. Welcome to the Star Tech Podcast. Mr. Dan, how are you? I'm good. Glad to be here. Happy to be here. So may you please tell all the viewers out there who you are and what you're all about. Who I am. Well, that might take uh, that might take longer than the half an hour we have. But uh, I'll tell you what I do. All right. Um, we and what we do, we are, as you mentioned, uh, growth equity investors. We're, in fact, the only growth equity um, private equity fund in the world that exclusively uh, focuses on uh, blockchain, Web3, crypto businesses. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, we have invested in 26 different businesses. Uh, We hold um, board positions on 12 of those. And, you know, the fund launched two and a half years ago. So the growth has been uh, very rapid, actually has taken me by, by surprise, really. Um, But you know what, really, it's the space that's grown uh, so quickly. When I first started looking at it in the middle of 2019, and this is broadly what I call the digital asset ecosystem, Mm -hmm. the total value of the space. So the value of all the cryptocurrencies plus all the equity of the businesses in the space was $300 billion. Mm. And today it's $1.7 trillion. And you might say $1.7 trillion, it's a lot. Um, 18 months ago at the peak, it was as high as 3.2 trillion. And so you had a move really from that 300 billion in the middle of 19 into the peak two and a half, three years later of 10 times. And so it just goes to show you that the pace and speed uh, of growth in the space is unlike anything I've seen in my uh, investing career. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, since you ask who who am I, um, I spent uh, 25 years in the macro hedge fund business uh, in the U.S. working for some some of the well-known investors. I started my career working for Julian Robertson of Tiger Management uh, in the early 90s in that global macro group that they had there, uh, and then ended up working for Michael Steinhardt, who was another well-known investor, eventually making my way to working for Steve Cohen at SAC Capital, mm-hmm. where I ran macro investment and ran my own portfolio and then um, the final person I ended up working with was Stan Druckenmiller at Duquesne, who, of course, ran Soros for all those years. Um, and so uh, I come from the traditional investment world, and I'm sort of one of the rare older guys, I would say, in the space who have that background, um, but yet um, really believe that you know, what's happening in the digital space uh, is the is the future. And so I've sort of st- stopped looking at the old world right. and um, I've been just looking at this new world now. Well, talking about money for a moment, I just want to ask, uh, as a kid, since you had a background of investments and finances, was Monopoly like your favorite board game? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um there were many other reasons. Uh, there weren't just, that wasn't the only driver, but uh, I did somehow take to that naturally. But I think that's very common for people in my area. Because uh, even when I was a kid, I didn't know much about money. You know, when you're about eight or nine years old, but some of our teachers, like every single class will have the game Monopoly, Uno, certain card games, you name it. But they'll always teach us that Monopoly is a very important game for you to learn because it will teach you about the foundation of business, how to handle money investments, you name it. Like these are certain terminologies. I think monopoly actually is a little bit more about leverage. I mean, Mm. you know, the more properties you own, 
the more you can leverage them to buy more properties. Right. And as long as the die don't like kill you, as long as you don't get the worst roles ever, <laughs> um, it really pays you to be leveraged. I would say I, I'm not, I'm not sure it really works that way. Well, I don't think it, it works that way so much. I mean, luck is important, yes. but not to the extent that it is in monopoly, but, Certainly that mentality of ownership and aggregating assets. Yes. Uh, it definitely, you know, starts there. It's like the, it's like the luck of the dice. If you roll the dice and your player lands on go to jail or you draw the car that says go to jail, that's it. It's pretty right. much you, it's pretty much in real life. You go bankrupt if you make the wrong move. Um, yeah, I think though in life, it's a little more forgiving. You can make mm. the wrong move and come back. You don't immediately right. go, uh, to jail, you don't immediately, <laughs> you know, um, it, go under. But um, I think, look, more important than that are sort of the good habits and discipline that you learn at a younger age. And I right. was, um, I was an athlete when I was younger. I was a swimmer and a water polo player, and oh. many early morning workouts and maintaining a strict regimen and diet and all these kinds of things. Mm. I think that plays into being a good. Uh, manager of money and a good risk manager. Right. Yeah. So coming up next, we'll be talking about the future of cryptocurrency. We're already here. We're in that era now, but there are still people across the world. They still have different opinions about investing or using cryptocurrency or investing into dig digital properties. Do you think there will be an era or a time, maybe the next decade or so, where cryptocurrency is going to be the mainstream type of currency or trade? Well, I think that the move into this digital asset ecosystem broadly is happening now. And I mentioned to you already the amount of value that is in the space. And so, I mean, I think most people would be surprised to learn that, you know, there's $1.7 trillion of invested capital in the space. I mean, that's, that's quite a lot, um, given the fact that some people still consider it a fledgling industry. I mean, look... And it's somewhat understandable because you have people like Gary Gensler at the SEC who, you know, recently came out and attacked Coinbase. Um, you know, I think the tide is already sort of, there's been pushback against how aggressive uh, Gensler uh, was. Um, but the reality is, is that, look, 85% of total world cryptocurrency trading volume is done outside of the U.S. Right. So this is not a U.S. phenomenon. This is not a U.S. asset. Even Larry Fink said two or three days ago that Bitcoin is a global asset. Two years ago, he said it was a complete fraud. So you have Larry Fink, who's, of course, the CEO of BlackRock, the $10 trillion U.S. asset manager, mm. uh, just in a span of two years. Uh, going from saying it was a fraud to now something, you know, saying that Bitcoin is a global asset. I think he says that largely he's hoping that he is the one that gets the ETF. Um, you know, he's BlackRock is put in to, um, you know, put in for um, uh, the uh, ability to build the uh, uh, the Bitcoin ETF. Right. And so, um, but I think different regions around the world see um a value in the space uh, through different lenses. And so, I, and, and you've just referred to that. I think that's exactly right. Um, you know, you go to Korea, for instance, and Korea is the blockchain gaming capital, essentially, of the world. Mm. Um, you know, you go to Paris and the big luxury goods companies there are, are focused on how to incorporate NFTs into their business models. How do they use NFTs to reach their um, to reach their um, uh, their um, customers, you know, their their customers. How do they also uh, use the blockchain um, for provenance for their you know high high end goods so that they're not duplicated? But then you know, and there are other places um, that look look at other aspects of the technology. Um, you know, you have a very uh, an OG Bitcoiner group in the U.S. Those are the ones who are early miners of Bitcoin in 2010, 11, 12, uh, you don't have some of those early Bitcoiners in, in France or in other places in Europe, for instance. Um, 
So I think each of the different areas around the world, I mean, just two weeks ago, the Japanese prime minister said that blockchain and Web3 have an important part to play in the future of, of Japan's uh, economy. Mm. Now, you're not going to hear that from Biden, right? Mm. Uh, you know, so I, I think that they're, the, they're different countries at different places on the adoption uh, curve here. You know, I've noticed that in the world of finances, there's always a celebrity. We already know the celebrities of music, the celebrities of movies, the celebrity of, of athletes. But let's talk about the celebrities of money. For instance, Richard Branson uh, that owns Virgin. Uh, we have um, Warren Buffett. We have Bill Gates. We have, um, I believe, Mark Zuckerberg, the billionaires. Yeah. Yeah. So, And then we went to social media, the owners of YouTube, the owners of Google, the mm -hmm. owners of Facebook. Now we're in the age of People who are like, who are the celebrities of Bitcoin, of, oh, of cryptocurrency? That's a great yes. question. I've been asked thousands of questions and no one has ever asked me that one. Um, but the, the, I think certainly the Winklevoss twins um, are definitely celebrities in this space. They've mm. been in it for over 10 years. There's a book called uh, Bitcoin Billionaires um, that... Is that, that came out, uh, I think Ben Mesrick wrote the book. It's actually a very entertaining book about the early days. Um, so they were OG uh, Bitcoiners, but they also started Gemini, which is the third largest uh, exchange in the U.S. after Coinbase and Kraken. So they're a little bit larger than life in the sense, you know, the story, of course, with, you know, Facebook and there was a movie out, um, you know, the... Um, what was it called? The social uh, network. Yeah, mm. it was the social network. And so they were featured prominently in that. They, they were, of course, Olympian uh, rowers and went to Harvard. And there's a whole sort of glam that surrounds them. So I would say th they are. And there's, there's also another person you might not know. Michael Saylor uh, is a very adamant Bitcoin Bitcoiner. Um, he really, I mean, is wax is philosophical about bitcoin i think right. if you're trying to understand why it has importance to the world i think certainly from a philosophical perspective you listen to his you know podcast i mean his interviews that that he's done um but it's actually changed uh the celebrity of the space or celebrities in quotes every sort of three to four years mm. so I think the celebrities of the five years ago uh, are not so much the same ones today. So you wouldn't include Gary V or Ty Lopez into the um, mix? Well, they're more... Gary Vaynerchuk? I think, yeah, I think Gary V is more NFT focused. So could he be mm. a celebrity in the NFT space? Oh, okay. He would. So this is what's so interesting is that this digital asset ecosystem has so many different sectors and subsectors within right. it. The space is not just about, you know, the price of Bitcoin or Ethereum. Um, you now have a giant world of stable coins and DeFi. You have NFTs. You have, um, as I mentioned before, the tokenization of real world assets theme. This is there are a few companies like Figure that we invested in that are focused on focused on putting real world assets on blockchains. And I think mm. that's where we're really headed. If you ask me. Like, what's the eventual future? What's the big picture? I think all things of value will one day sit on a blockchain and reside somewhere in this, I call it DAE, digital asset ecosystem. Um, I think that's where we're moving. And you might say, well, why, why do we need to do that? Well, instantaneous settlement with no centralized counterparty, mm -hmm. um, with, you know, backed by open source code, um, you know, it still takes two weeks to send a, a wire, right, from New York to, I don't know, Nigeria. You pick, you know, any place that's just not common. Right. Um, you know, even New York, Paris probably still takes at least a few days. And so really? we have the ability, um, yeah, for confirmation, for to clear, um, you know, oh. we, we have the ability today to have instantaneous Peer to peer, actually. We still have to go through security protocol. I'm yeah. sorry. We still have to go through security protocol. You mean through the in the old system? Yeah. Well, I think we have to go through a lot of things. I mean, the technology, for instance, um, uh, uh, much of the technology 
um, the um, not ACH technology, but the um, uh, the traditional wire technology is pre-internet. It mm. was um, actually invented in the fifties, right? And so that doesn't. It just seems odd to me that in this digital world today, we're sending money around using such an old technology. Right. Right. And so it just, um, and I, I think also countries want to have control uh, of their money. I mean, again, money is only one aspect of what is going on in this digital asset world. Right. Yeah. It's just like one, like one component. It's not the component. It's a component. Yeah, I mean, it may space. be the component, but I think that... Mm, it's not the apex. Sorry. So I noticed that uh, we're going to talk about your $1.2 billion investment in 26 different companies. Yeah. Now, you you said that you're kind of a movie fan in a way. So you've seen <laughs> Trading Places, you've seen Suits, you've seen Wolf of Wall Street, but I'm going to use a Marvel Universe reference. Okay, that's not going to be good. <laughs> I don't, I, all right, go ahead, let me... All right. Well, you know the superhero Spider Man. Yeah. Okay. We're talking about we're talking about the Spider Man back in like nineteen ninety nine, like the first movie Spider Man. Okay. And uh, there was a scene where Goblin, he's like a villain, um, and uh, yeah, there was like these, uh, of course, these all these CEOs, as you claim, there are CEOs, they're investors to his company, his scientific company, creating futuristic technology, and uh, he he stood up, he made a grand announcement saying that. Thing, you know, uh, uh, assets are going high. Business is going high. We're winning. We're we're uh, we're right. the number one company in the world. <laughs> and then all the CEOs are like, "Well, I'm sorry, but um, we're going to bankrupt your company. And we're going to buy everything off. We're going to buy all the shares." And we're like, "What? Really?" So the trust went down. Right. I'm not going to do. I'm not going to do any spoiler alert. But and then he got he got upset. But there was a the reason I brought that up is a sense of trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I could tell his partners did not trust him. So that's why he became the goblin. But um, I got. I'm it. not going to. I'm, right. not gonna, so I'm not going to. I'm not going to spoil it. Yeah. So trust. So how did you manage to persuade, uh, you know, your partners to invest this amount of money? Like, what oh. was the style? Like, you know, phone operations. You just yeah. called multiple people up, or no, no, no. Look, I mentioned before, I was in the investment world for you know over 25 years, and I did quite well and had a track record and mm. had also reputation for doing a lot of work and having a serious process. And so um, initially I just wanted to invest my own money and then some people, um, some friends of mine and people in my network and we raised a fund. It was about a hundred million dollars. And so um, it's amazing. Well, yeah, it was just, that was at the very beginning. And the idea was to invest in the more developed companies in the space. We don't own any cryptocurrency or any tokens, even though some of the companies do on their balance sheets, but we didn't, you know, I'm not a venture capitalist. Uh, I'm not really a technologist either in the sense that some of the guys in Silicon Valley are. Right. I invest in businesses, um, um, that are already, I, I would say, past their early point, have generally more than $50 million in revenue, uh, have already achieved product market fit. They have a niche. Uh, there's a team of some significant size. There's a board that's properly managed and run. They, you know, they look, they, they, you know, and they come to us for a little growth capital. So, you know, how do they get from 50 million in revenue to 500? And maybe mm. there's an acquisition they want to do. Maybe, um, you know, they just need a little more capital to really get things going in, you know, up that exponential curve. And so um, we're different than many of the funds in the space. Uh, as I said, you know, A16Z and Polychain and Pantera and Parify, a lot of these uh, funds, they invest very early stage, pre-seed, C, A round. They're looking to make 500X on their investments. Mm. We're not. We I, like prefer to, to have a little bit less risk uh, at inception. We're not going to be the single best performing fund in the space, but right. I think we'll definitely, from a risk-adjusted perspective, I think we very well could be. And, you know, we're still shooting to make a 5 to 10X return over the 10 year life of the fund. And so, um, you know, you asked me, how did we get to that number? Well, I, as I mentioned before, the space grew a, a lot, number one, 
Number two, we're the only fund that's exclusively focused on this area uh, of investing in sort of mid, what are called mid-stage um, companies. So it was like, so, it was the right time to invest. You were at the, the right, right, time, right place, all, right time, right market. Right. I mean, that's part partially what you're supposed to do as a good investor is assess that. Mm. But I actually think the best time to invest in our space is actually right now. Um, because many of the companies that we passed on over the last 18 months um, have come in, in in valuation terms. So this is something important to mention because um, we we actually did not make a single investment between April and October of 22. Many traditional investors, traditional private equity investors, came into this space and pushed up valuations dramatically. They were paying 30, 50, 80 times revenue for businesses. We never paid more than 10 to 12 times revenue on any of our businesses, on average around eight times revenue. So funnily enough, I, I'm a guy that really cares about my entry price and about valuation. So I'm sort of a value guy in a growth space, which is a little uncommon. But, um, you know, we need to see when we make an investment that we can make a 10x return over the 10 year life of the into the into that one investment and again broadly a five to 10x on the portfolio but if i can't model to a 10x return then we have to pass and so when valuations get driven up um i just have to pass even on companies that we like so this saved us last year because we passed on ftx three times uh, we passed on BlockFi. We passed on Celsius. Mm. Um, why did we pass on FTX? Well, the the guy wanted a $32 billion valuation, and he was only doing a few hundred million in revenue. And so it was 50, 60 times plus greater um, multiple, mm. number one. Number two, to invest in FTX at $32 billion, I really needed to think that it could be a $320 billion company. Right. Now that's a really hard bet to make. And so our, you know, maybe it would have been true. Obviously he's a fraud went and uh, et cetera. And we know the story, but the reality is for us, it's a lot easier to think that a company is going to be a five, uh, can go from $500 million to 5 billion. Mm. Right. I think that's just an easier ask um, and it's, that's sort of our sweet spot, those types of valuations, you know. And that's why I've noticed is that, as they mentioned in business, it, um, the higher the risk, the higher the, the higher the award, but also the greater yeah. the cost then the greater the consequence. Yeah. I mean, look, you have to find as an investor, you have to find that place on that risk reward curve that you're most comfortable with. And so I'm not personally really that comfortable with the venture investment model. Those guys have done great, but their methodology in some way is, you know, make 10 investments, nine go to zero, and then one can be Google maybe. Mm. And, you know, and then your portfolio is up, you know, 30 times or whatever it is. And so that's not really uh, an investment style that I've ever been comfortable with. I want to make a broad bet on a sector because I have a very high degree of confidence that that sector is going to go up in value. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's a different model. It's, I, you know, it comes from my background of having been a macro investor and I've done something similar to what I'm doing now in other areas. Yeah. In well, agriculture and in precious metals. They say the best way for a financial literacy is to, uh, pretend that you're playing an arcade game. Cause I know that when you talk about money, uh, yes, money is, of course it's realistic. The numbers are realistic because it talks about how many of the resources that you own. But when you imagine it, uh, in an arcade way, uh, the higher your score, that means you are the winner. Mm-hmm. So you like, for instance, if you're playing Sonic the Hedgehog, I don't know if you play video games, Sonic the Hedgehog mm-hmm. or Super Mario Brothers, uh, you have to care about how many coins that you get. But if you hit an enemy, then the coins go down. The the numbers go down. Right. And I figure out it's the same way. I'm, I'm, I usually like to compare other imaginations yeah. Yeah, into, into our topic. Say, yeah, but I would say here that I don't, I'm not trying to make the highest number of points. I'm not, I don't think I've already said, I don't think we're going to be the best performing fund in the space. You I want to be the top 10 the risk. Mm. I think for the risk, 
we are, you know, certainly at the top of the heap. Right. Um, of the 26 companies I invested in, only one has, is impaired. So we will live through an entire bear phase where many of the cryptocurrency underlying cryptocurrencies are down 70, 80%. And we only have one company uh, that's impaired. It's only two and a half percent of the portfolio. Mm. So that's really the strength of, of what we do. Why would we invest in companies that are making higher, uh, you know, um, uh, more money that are further in on the risk curve? Uh, it's because they have the ability to stand up better during bear phases. So how does the UAE compare globally to other nations in embracing Web3 and also digital assets? Oh, well, it is definitely a leader here. And I think that um, certainly one of the reasons I've been back four times in the last 18 months, um, you know, I think um, it's uh, Abu Dhabi and uh, Dubai both. Uh, as you know, you know, we had a, we hosted a, uh, educational uh, symposium just a month ago with in partnership with VARA, the Virtual Assets Regulatory Authority of Dubai. We brought five of our you know prominent company CEOs uh, to talk about their companies to an audience of 200. His Excellency Alamari uh, hosted the event, and um, you know I the the point for me uh, of bringing them here was to showcase. Um, that there are larger companies in the space that are making hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue, um, that the space, you know, again, tarnished a little bit by the SBF uh, fraud, but that, you know, as I often say, the space is not a 32-year-old bros pumping and dumping uh, tokens, which sometimes it has that reputation for, but that there are big companies, big businesses in different of the subsectors that I mentioned before making money in the space. And so Dubai, the CEO of VARA is an old friend of mine, Henson Orser. And Henson uh, turned around with his team and in the span of six weeks put on this fantastic symposium. I mean, it went from an idea to uh, a reality in six weeks, which is just incredible. Um, you know, I think Abu Dhabi also has done quite a lot to encourage crypto businesses blockchain web three businesses, mm. uh, to come to uh, Abu Dhabi, set up offices here, hire people. And so, you know, if there are three or four places around the world that are at the leading cutting edge, uh, this is one of them. You know, I'm going to ask a star question. I, so you've mentioned before that you've been doing this for a long time. And you also mentioned that cryptocurrency is going to replace paper cash someday. But are you going to miss the old days where when people were rich and had a lot of money, they used to do this, throw their cash, or they throw it in the air, like, oh, I'm rich. But if people are rich in cryptocurrency, how will people? <laughs> so I still do it. I still have a big chunk of cash as, a, as an older guy. I still carry it around. Uh, I don't know that it completely replaces it. Um, right. But yes, that's where we're heading. But how we, how can we yeah. show off our money? It's like, how can people celebrate? Hey, I got well, uh, I got money it. on my phone. I got high numbers. Like, right. We so, can't throw our phone in the air. So how we... Wait a second. Hold on a second. <laughs> it's, 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 it's another great question that just has not been asked before. And again, I've done you know, certainly between 50 and 100 different interviews. And and Yatsu talks about this a lot. He's the CEO of Anamoka. He's been very active in the region. He's been to, you know, he's been in the UAE many, many times. And um, But Anamoka is a, the leading NFT metaverse blockchain gaming company in the world. Uh, I think the last round it raised capital at five and a half billion dollars. And he talks a lot about um, the ownership of of certain types of NFTs and art uh, on uh, NFTs um, as a way for people to show their you know show their wealth in a way. I mean, I mm. that's not really a thing I'm into so much. But you know, you have the bored apes and you have the punks and you have art. For instance, the Ringers just sold at Sotheby's for six point two million dollars. It was a record. Um, you had another board ape just last week sell for, I think it was $1.2 million. So, you know, it's, this is all, uh, all Thorsten Veblen and the theory of the leisure class, you know, showing your, uh, how does, in a night, it's early 19th century, uh, early 20th century America, you know, how did Americans move up the social, 
uh, ladder and how did they show their wealth, etc. And so there were certain ways back then, of course, you know, they had the fancier horse or whatever it was. Mm. And so Yat makes the case, and I think this is true, and I, I think if you can find one of his interviews, and there are many of them, you should listen, that the this digitization of value, um, you know, and the fact that so many people today, especially, you know, I would say under 35, spend so much time online that they're building out their lives uh, online in these metaverses. And then whether it's owning or building the coolest house in sandbox or whether it's owning the coolest uh, car NFT, um, you know, I think that that, that's already starting to be a thing. Mm. So I think that's the flex. If you're asking like, what's the flex, <laughs> how are people going to flex? I think they're already <laughs> doing it. 6.2 million right. for, uh, you know, a non fungible token. And also putting a price tag on a product and knowing how much, how much to sell is also an art form itself. Like George Lucas selling star Wars, uh, franchise for seven billion to Disney or mm -hmm. uh, Elon Musk buying, I think, what forty four million USD to owning Twitter and oh, probably four billion, forty four billion. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, the B, yeah. yeah oh, so billion. putting the decimal more to the. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yes, what are your guidelines and tips for investing in cryptocurrency for beginners, such as young adults? Well, I think anyone really uh, under thirty or so is digital native, and I think it. it it's really easy, you know, you just, um, very, very easy to start by just, you know, getting onto Coinbase, having a digital wallet and purchasing a little Bitcoin. You can purchase like $1 uh, of Bitcoin. You don't, a full Bitcoin is now $30,000. You'd buy, you know, a fraction of that, which is what you do when you buy a less. And I think that's the way you learn first is whether it's Coinbase or Gemini or, in the region, Coin Mina, um, you know, I've met with their, uh, had a nice chat with their CEO last week. I think that's a company in the region um, that's very interesting. And the CEO there, uh, Talal, I think he's um, really pushing hard. And so that would be a very easy way. Just, just get a wallet and try it. And then try sending your cousin or your brother, you know, that dollar okay and you see sort of the magic of how it works when uh you're able to do that and it's it's very easy to do i just don't um you know i think explaining that to a 65 year old is a little more difficult because right. they're still walking around with that big wad of cash as you pointed out before and they're in their pocket and that's what they're comfortable they always say well i can't feel it Right. Well, you know, if you if you're a younger person and, you know, you've been playing video games and you've been trading skins and you have value that's on the Internet, let's just say it that way, mm. um, you've gotten it for a long time. Right. Like, of course, things that are on the Internet can have value. But say that to, you know, an older person, um, this is the most age demarcated area I've ever invested in or I've ever seen. Right. Um, when I speak to people under 35, they all get it that this is the future. Right. You speak to people over 60, they all think it's like a fraud or has to do with ga um, gambling or, you know, or uh, laundering or something like that. So it may be that, you know, you asked me that question before about when does adoption happen? It's been happening slowly, but maybe it's really just a thing of, you know, generational change. Mm -hmm. And so as the generations, you know, one moves out and the other one becomes of age, um, you know, I think it, it becomes more prominent. And also how can people contact you if they want to do business with you? What's the best way? Oh, well, we have a, uh, I'm on LinkedIn on Twitter. I'm on Twitter, D tap cap. But we have our website. You can easily, you know, uh, www.itsonertfund.com. And, um, you know, you can see the team and the investments we've made. Um, the investments we've made are on our 10T site. So that's 10tfund.com. Very easy. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
you know, we have another fund that's going to be launching in the next few months. So hopefully we'll have uh, the capital we want to put to work. Um, I, I've just, there's so many opportunities now uh, because the bear phase has ended and yet people haven't really come back into the space so strongly, which is perfect for me mm. because I like investing when other people aren't. I don't like having competition for deals. So you like being the big fish in the small pond. Well, right. I like being the big fish, the only fish in the pond, mm. not just the big fish. And so at the moment we're the only fish or, you know, maybe there are one or two others, but so we'd like to take advantage of that. Um, I don't know how long that lasts, but yeah, hopefully, um, I think we have at least a six to 12 month window. Well, Mr. Dan, thank you so much for being a part of the Star Tech podcast, and we would love to have you back next time. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you so much, Mr. Dan, for being a part of our show, the Star Tech podcast, sharing a lot about the wonders of money, finances, investments, and a lot more. Money, money, money. Not only that, please, everyone, participate in our show on YouTube, Spotify, Google, Apple, you name it. It can be on your iPhones, iPads, TVs, whichever technology you want, it's all there. My name is Mr. Aurelius, the host of the Star Tech Podcast, which is promoted every single Friday weekly. Shout out to Mr. Phil and Mr. Shahab. I'm out. Mm -hmm.